Good evening, everyone. How are we all doing? Oh, it's an English audience. How are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Yasmin Abdul Majid, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this special event organized in partnership with the World Monuments Fund and Intelligence Squared. Unfortunately, one of our speakers, Alberta Whittle, has had to pull out of the event due to adverse weather in Scotland. But I'm thrilled to be joined by three brilliant speakers to explore the role that heritage sites and monuments can play in unlocking black history. So, we have Bonnie Greer, a playwright, critic, and novelist. She was born in Chicago and has lived in the UK since 1986. Her award-winning plays have been performed at the Royal Opera House and at Soho Theatre, and she was previously Deputy Chairman of the British Museum's Board of Trustees. Please welcome Bonnie. <laughs> we also have David Harewood, who starred in, a, in an array of iconic dramas on screen and on stage, including Homeland, Blood Diamond, The Night Manager, and most recently, Best of Enemies at the Young Vic Theatre. His first book, Maybe I Don't Belong Here, was published in September 2021. Welcome, David. And John Darlington. John is an archaeologist and author. He joined the World Monument Fund Britain, WMF, in 2015 as executive director and has worked on conservation projects in the UK that vary um, from Cistercian, Cistercian, Cistercian monasteries and Georgian mansions through to British brutalist sites and a recently restored Victorian viaduct. He also runs a number of w WMF projects in North Africa and the Caribbean. Welcome, John. So before we start, I'm going to tell you a little bit about World Monuments Fund. WMF is a charity that champions the conservation of exceptional works of architecture and monuments for people. This could be any type of building or physical site, from the preservation of Nina Simone's childhood home to the majestic Angor Archaeological Park in Cambodia. What I love is WMF works with partners and local communities to ensure that endangered sites are in their care and have a long-term future. Part of their mission is to engage people in heritage and the stories of places shaped by history, why they're relevant today and why they're important for the future. WMF has also worked on a number of African sites that we'll talk about today. And I'll also mention that this event will run for about an hour and 15 minutes, and I will be asking you all to ask some questions towards the end. So please, you know, if you, keep some questions along the way. But we'll start with you, John. Tell us a little bit about the key sites of the World Monuments Fund and why you are interested in preserving these places. Thank you, Yasmin. So, so World Monuments Fund has been around for almost 60 years now. And our, our mission is ambitious, but actually quite simple. So our mission is to safeguard irreplaceable heritage across the entire world. And uh, as Yasmin said, we've been involved with very, various different projects from the temples of Angkor Wat through to the terraces of Machu Picchu through to the rock cut churches of Lalabella in Ethiopia, and, and many other sites which people probably haven't heard of. Part of, our, part of our DNA is that whilst we operate globally, uh, we, we own absolutely nothing. So we have no ownership whatsoever. So the really important thing for us, which is the requirement of every project that we work with, is that it's, it's vested in the local communities. So the local community is coming to us asking for help, inviting us in. Uh, and that actually creates a, a wonderful balance for us because essentially we can operate globally and we can share those messages, we can share our expertise, but everything that we do is vested in something which is happening locally and something which is delivered on the ground. So that's a kind of rather wonderful synergy for us. Uh, and one of the issues that we face time and time again is based on the fact that, that history is, is not balanced. History is not balanced even in, in the telling of history, nor is it balanced in terms of which buildings, which monuments and which stories get preserved and, and conserved and promoted. Uh, so an important part of our role is by is working with local communities to put a spotlight on what we would call underrepresented heritage. That's very much a fundamental to what we do. 
and by underrepresented heritage, that's an extraordinarily wide range of, of heritage sites. So it could include Yazidi shrines in northern Iraq, uh, a heavily persecuted people, particularly by ISIS, through to uh, a piece of work that we're doing at the moment at Bears Ears National Park in the United States, where we're working with the communities there to actually make sure that that traditional knowledge and understanding is, is translated into the current cultural management practice. And of course, part, of course, part of what we are interested in is this story that we're discussing tonight about slavery and civil rights. So what does that look like for World Monuments Fund? What's, a, what's an example of that? And the example I'm going to give is of Bunts Island in uh, Sierra Leone. Now, Bunts Island is essentially in the middle of the Sierra Leone uh, River. river. Uh, it's a couple of miles north of Freetown, the capital. And its location is important because its location is a site which uh, trading ships, it's the furthest site upriver which trading ships could reach. And the trade in which those ships are dealing is, of course, the, the, the slave trade. And Bunts Island effectively is probably the most lucrative site in the whole of Western Africa for the transition of slaves from the continent of Africa through to the Caribbean to work in the sugar plantations or through to uh, the, the United States of America to, to work uh, in the cotton or rice fields. And it's really interesting that if you go to Georgia or South Carolina today, there are still linguistic links between people who live there and people in Sierra Leone. So the, the site itself that, that we're, we're interested in is a, a simple place. It's a fortified site with a wall which runs all the way around it. It has got a, a manager's house, a kind of a, an operator's house. It's got storerooms. It's got a magazine and all those things. But the, the main thing which occupies the site are the, essentially the, the barracks uh, for, for the enslaved people who are waiting transit from there. Uh, and the next picture shows what uh, the, the site looks like now, because it's, it's suffering from the, the ravages of, uh, of climate change. It's suffering from all kinds of uh, decay uh, due to where it is. Uh, so what we're doing, based in the local community, so the local community came to us and said, uh, we would like assistance here. And they came to us as part of a program called the World Monuments Watch Program, which happens every two years, uh, where we select 25 sites from across the world which speak to a bigger theme. So Bunts Island is part of the, the 2016 Watch Programme. Uh, and essentially, we've been working there uh, since 2016, putting, uh, restoring the site, so slowing down that attrition, that weathering, so that it doesn't collapse into a complete ruin but also working with the community in, in other different ways. So creating an educational facility there so people can understand what's going on, uh, building local capacity in the site, uh, and, and creating a visitor trail so people can, again, learn from this particular place. Uh, that work's continuing right to this very day, and the World Monuments Fund uh, principal program director is actually in the room. He's just returned from Bunts Island. Uh, and maybe we'll, we'll hear from him a little bit later. But the main point I wanted to, to pick out was that if you conserve just some of those physical markers of places which mark slavery, then you have something to hold and to commemorate, learn and to remember. Thank you, John. And thank you for, for giving us some context for what WMF does. But what I want to do now is bring it to the individual level because we, we've talked about place and we've talked about monuments and, and how that relates to history. But Bonnie, I want to ask you, and David, I'll then come to you, when did you start thinking about your history and the history of the place that you lived in? My dad was born in Mississippi, rural Mississippi, and grew up during the Depression. Um, he was born in a town called Money, and that was where Emmett Till was murdered in the 50s. Um, my dad came from what was pretty much what you would call ground mall racial segregation. Uh, the way that you, the poll test to be able to vote in Mississippi when my dad was grown up, growing up was if you could read Mandarin Chinese. If you couldn't, you couldn't vote. Um, my dad also uh, served in the Army of the United States during World War II 
Uh, he was here for D-Day, and the Army of the United States in World War II was racially segregated. So if you can imagine the United States fighting World War II and also fighting black men and black women, uh, Americans at the same time. So my background is pretty much, my dad called himself a race man. Um, and that was a term used in those days for what we would call now people who were, um, you know, very much embedded in Af blackness. My father had no time for white people except uh, his son-in-law. Um, um, you know, the Got couple. Of, yeah, a yeah. couple. A couple of the guys he knew, uh, the priest who baptized us, and ordinary, you know, ordinary white people, but not the white establishment. So I grew up very much aware on the south side of Chicago, and I grew up at a time when the civil rights era was mm. front and center, was part of my life. I desegregated a school. I was bused to school when I was a kid. Uh, when I was a teenager, I worked with Fred Hampton, the Chicago Black Panther Party, um, and this has been my life. So, you know, there's a lot of things I've mm. seen, a lot of things that, you know, I've experienced. So I would say being a black person um, and then an African-American person, as Reverend Jackson told us we should call ourselves, um, has been part of my life. Mm. You've always. always had to know history. Well, always. You know, I thought my father was too until I came home one day with my hair like this and my father said, what happened to your head? So, um, but other than that, it's always been my, Thank my you. life. And we're going to explore some of the, what you've talked about with the civil rights, your coming of age in the civil rights movement um, later, I think, in the, in the event because it's, it's utterly fascinating. But David, I'm going to come to you. When did you first start thinking about your own history, and, and you grew up in Britain, the history of the place that you grew up in. Um, it's, it's actually quite a difficult and complex question for me. Um, I mean, you said in your introduction, my, my, the title of my autobiography is, is called um, Maybe I Don't Belong Here. Um, and I, I, in a, from, a, from a personal perspective, the, the, the question of my history is only something I've really started engaging with. Uh, in the latter part of my life. Um, and I think that's been really quite unfortunate because, um, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a young kid, you know, born in, in England in the late 60s, um, and growing up in the 70s, you know, we were always taught to sort of assimilate and join in. And, and you're British, you're English, you're not, you're just English. You just, you have no other, you have no other identity. Mm. And as I, um, when, as I grew up and I went to drama school and went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and threw myself into learning, you know, all these wonderful playwrights and uh, learning about British history in school. But it was only when I came out of school and went into the real world mm. that, and was reject, rejected by that white establishment, which your father was talking about, uh, rather uh, cruelly rejected by that establishment. That's when... When I came out of drama school, I had a full-on psychotic breakdown mm. and ended up being sectioned in a, in a mental institution because I couldn't... Uh, that rejection for me of being told that I didn't belong or made, being made to feel that I didn't belong was such a jarring experience for me mm. to be rejected by... almost like being told to go back home. Or, uh, that rejection of, uh, was, was, a, was a very painful experience for me. And I buried that sort of pain mm. for, um, in order to recover from my breakdown, I buried that pain for nearly 30 years. Mm. And then two or three years ago, I did a documentary for the BBC where I revisited my um, breakdown and was really shocked mm. to uncover that a lot of my, the, the discomfort that I was going through was all to do with my identity and race. Mm. And because I hadn't, taken a grip of my heritage, because mm. I hadn't really understood my heritage, I don't think I had a, a, a very um, a, a, a sounding board um, it, to, to kind of withstand this uh, rejection. Um, I, just, to, just to sort of, to sort of uh, pinpoint it, I, I can remember, this, this shows how much my, my experience has changed, that 
I remember working in West Yorkshire uh, years, years ago, years and years and years ago, almost like 30, 20, 27 years ago, and going to vi going, driving down the road one day and seeing a sign for Harewood House. And I thought, oh, that's a coincidence. Hmm. That's the same name as me. So I went to visit. Ha had no idea of the history and legacy mm. of the house. No idea. I walked around this house and thought it was wonderful and thought it was fine. And then a couple of years later, um, I think it was BBC Yorkshire did a, a piece where they flew me back to Barbados, where I sort of began to understand the legacy and understand my story. You talk mm. about engaging with the, my story. I started to engage with my heritage. Mm. And that's when I suddenly realized that there was, a, I'm not just a kid from Birmingham. I have this whole legacy that I have to engage with. And it's been, it's since engaging with my black heritage, um, I've found a much more, much more sure of footing. Um, I've been to Harewood House several times since then. I know David uh, Lascelles is, is here tonight. Um, uh, and I, you know, I, 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 I've since been back to, to, to Barbados and understood uh, my heritage in, in, a, in, a, in a very, very different way. Can we, I mean, is it if you're comfortable, only if you're comfortable, like we can be a bit more specific about what that relationship is. And when you went back to, to Barbados, maybe my, the slip of my tongue is to say when you went back to Barbados, I don't know if maybe that's the right thing to say or not, but when you went to Barbados and what you learnt about your family well, when you learn, Well, when you learn about the condition, you know, I learnt about the conditions of the slaves and I learnt about my family and I was, I was actually given, I think they did a bit of a who do you think you are thing and, and they, did, they, they, they drew my, uh, a genealogist, uh, traced my family line right back to 1820. And it was really emotional mm. to know that I could sort of reach out and touch, see my, my, the very first slave that was given the name Harewood. Mm. And from that slave, Richard, his name was from Richard, he had a son called uh, Bartholomew. Bartholomew had a son called um, uh, Henry. Henry had a son called Richard. Richard had a son called Cornelius, who was my dad. And when you see that line, you suddenly, you suddenly, I, I suddenly got a, a different, a completely different understanding of mm. history, a different understanding of the story of my, of, of my family. Of who you are. And, bon and of who I am. Bonnie, I'm going to, sorry to cut you, That's David. Okay. You look like you want to say something. I do, because this is, this is, uh, David and I, we all had a chat before we came on. And, and as David's talking to me, I've been trying to talk to him in public for a long time because I want him to come to the <laughs> British Museum where I do these conversations. And I want to pick it up here. David and I have both chosen a theater mm. and the theater has chosen us. Mm -hmm. You thrive in a country not of your birth mm -hmm. and so do I, okay? I um, went to Elmina. Mm -hmm. I have no idea where my ancestors come from, by the way, I have no Clue. For those who, who might not know, where is Almina? And El what is sorry, no, let me okay. just do that. I, uh, about uh, three decades ago, I was teaching in Ghana and I went to Elmina on the coast, the Atlantic coast, where Elmina is a slave fortress that the Spanish owned, then the Dutch, uh, the British. And I did a day trip down to the coast. Uh, first, I went to Kumasi. And I want to say I was with um, um, a European. And the reason mm -hmm. I want to say what he was is because I went to Kumasi with him uh, to look at the Ashantiheni's palace, uh, the ruins of it. And he, it was a very hot day. And he was absolutely uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. He was very red. And I wasn't uncomfortable. <laughs> and then I suddenly realized, could white people have been up here anyway? So how did I get down to the coast? And that's when I began my investigation mm. of what the, you know, what the story is. And I went to Elmina, and this was before it was very touristy. Mm. And I remember standing on the ramparts of Elmina and looking down on the Atlantic shore, and there were black men there, and they were fishing. And I thought, well, who were they? Mm. Were they there when I was taken? Mm. 
and who brought me to Elmina. How did it happen? Mm. And for one thing, I felt very, you know, the, the Ghanaians were saying, oh, sister, you're going to cry and everything. Well, people were crying. Mm. You know, Americans cry a lot. <laughs> and, um, but the other thing I felt when I looked over that rampart and grateful that Elmina was there was that I felt very proud because somebody on that slave ship decided to stay alive. That's mm. how we're here. They just, somebody on the plantations decided to stay alive. And that's who I'm dedicated mm. to, the people who decided to stay alive and the people on the boat. Because to be on that boat, you had to make that decision. Mm. Um, the Caribbean for me, and I've never been there, but the Caribbean for me is like a sort of cauldron of genius. And I'm really, really interested in knowing more about all the languages of the Caribbean. So I, I, I want to say that to say that my investigation is how I got to the coast, mm. OK? It isn't so much the enslavement, mm. but I want to know how to, how to get there. Mm. And that's been something that I pursued for a good deal of my life, which is one reason I'm in museums. I want to know how I got there to the coast. Isn't it fascinating that so much of history or so much of our memories, even if we're not directly related to that particular history, is in place? I think you know we're speaking about Elmina or Bunce Island or Harewood House, and we might not even necessarily know what emotion we're experiencing, or we will experience when we get to that place, but we get there and all of a sudden there is, and for me, I, I find that fascinating as somebody who's been born somewhere, grew up somewhere, lived somewhere else. I think there's, regardless of you know, how much movement is in our life, place still has a huge impact. And David, before we move on from the Hayward House conversation, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what engagement does Hayward have, have, Hayward House have with its colonial history? And I mean, I'm sure that the conversation has progressed from that first time you engaged with it. It has, and um, um, you know, obviously, my understanding of the history uh, behind it has 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 changed. Um, it's 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 a difficult one. I remember I remember you know going going uh, going there. The last time I went there was was like week, weeks after the um, uh, George Floyd was murdered, and mm. uh, it was it was a very emotive time and. Um, I can remember arriving at, in, in Yorkshire and arriving close to the estate, and I started to see my I said, see the name Harewood on fences mm. and on vans mm. and on doors and on thing on things that were property. Yeah, and. Um, it was it was very very it was a very very complex feeling. I didn't mm. I didn't sleep a wink. <laughs> even though mm. it was a very comfortable a very comfortable uh, uh, place that I was staying, I I, I was I, I was very 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 uh, mm. conflicted with it. And mm. I know that um, you know as, as I say, you know, um, the house is doing a, a fantastic job of telling its its history. And um, as, as David you know uh, quite rightly says. You know, he, he, he's he, he's not responsible, but he is account. He has to can be accountable. Yeah. And I think he's been very, very open and about uh, the house and very welcoming to me and very welcoming to the pe pe people who have been asking questions, which I think is extremely commendable. Mm. Um, and you know, he's not shying away from the the, the conversation, um, and that's really helped me. It, mm. It's it's made it even more complex because <laughs> it would be easier to hate him and sort of yeah. <laughs> try yeah, and run. Yeah. And burn the place down, but it's 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 he's actually a very very welcoming and uh, and very understanding person. So, uh, you know, you have all this passion inside of you, these questions inside of you um, about the history, the legacy of, of the house and my name, and you don't kind of know what know, know what to do with it. Know, yeah. And but I think it's important that that's why I felt it was important to sit down and speak to my children, uh, who are 17 and 18. Mm. Uh, and tell them about the house and tell them about the legacy because mm. I didn't know about it until mm. I was in my 30s. And I think it's really important that they know about it as soon as possible mm. so, that, so that they don't experience that same sort of psychic shock that I did of suddenly realising you have a whole legacy, a whole heritage that you're just not aware of. But 
But then the question becomes, what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I, I, um, I think there's a kind of fetishization, and we have to be very careful about legacy and about heritage because people can fetishize it, and it is then becomes useless. It becomes literally useless. History is a construct. It mm. isn't a thing that exists mm. outside of anything else. And, and as I say on my podcast, it's written by the winners. The losers do not write history. Mm. So there's one reason why we know so much about kings and queens, this and that, because they were the king and the queen. I mean, we don't know who built the Ashanti Henny's compound. We don't know mm. who built Angor Wat. We don't know who built anything because they didn't write the history. And so, you know, my big thing is about younger people getting, you know, all I, I call Wakanda sized, where it becomes this whole thing about kings and queens, where royalty is an oppressive system. Mm. So you don't actually want mm. to get into the kings and the queens thing. I'm more interested in the people. You know, who were the people who built these things? Who were the people who were in the cane fields? Who were the people in the cotton fields? Who were the people on the boat? Who were the people? And that, that's, that's where I am now, mm. is trying to tell but those that's stories. Also, but that's, that's why I think there is a, I think there's a move this week with uh, Troy Deeney, the footballer, uh, with a move to try and decolonize the curriculum, mm -hmm. which I think is really important, that, that we do learn other stories, that mm -hmm. we learn other legacies, we learn other, we, other, other aspects of history. Um, because um, a, a more rounded educational mm -hmm. uh, understanding of empire um, would, would, I think, benefit um, we, people. We need a deeper understanding. We really do, because it is very complex. Is I mean, it's a very uh, deeply complicated story, and uh, it's a story of human beings at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Yeah. I think there's two things I want to add. Um, one is, I think, quite often we think of the histories that you're talking about, Bonnie, as sort of forgotten or, um, you know, maybe underrepresented, but quite often they're actively erased, right? These are, the mm. things are not forgotten just because. The, things quite often are actively erased or chosen not to be remembered. But, but, but less than you think. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's my point. I mean, I think we make a big drama about the erasure, mm -hmm. but literally, um, you know, you, a peasant or a person who, I mean, using the word peasant as a person as opposed to nobility, they didn't even have a last name, mm -hmm. and they were white. So, you know, those of us who were enslaved were even more so. I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, people think there was an active erasure, that erasure was a big active activity. They just didn't write it down. You know, I mean, I, my last name is the name of some uh, uh, guy from Ulster. I have no idea what my last name really was. I don't even know where I'm from. You know, I don't know any of those things. So it was, it was, I think we shouldn't make a drama about erasure. We should make a, make a drama about archaeology. I think we need to dig more. Just dig so, more. So I'm just going to come is, in yeah, here. I was going to yeah. say, this is the perfect moment. Thank seems, you so much. Oh, as, as an archaeologist, <laughs> I should be stepping into this bit. And, yeah, and, and I, guess, I guess part of what, why I love archaeology mm. is because it, 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 it is biased. Archaeology is biased in lots of different ways, yeah. but it, it, through archaeology, you don't necessarily need to get into that narrative about kings and queens, because essentially, mm. when you're excavating, you're excavating yeah, you what yeah, exactly whatever people have eaten, the houses they've lived in, what's you know their their crafts, their arts. You can pick all those things up through the stains in the ground. So that's in, uh, so I think there is a democratization through archaeology. Absolutely, and it, and and I think unless we we get into what I call deep archaeology, and I mean on a psychological basis too, where you find a story and you don't settle for that story. You go to the story that's underneath that story, and the mm. story that's underneath that story, and the story that's underneath that story, because the transatlantic slave trade was massively complicated endeavor, mm. massively complicated endeavor, which used all kinds of hooks from tradition, not only in Europe, but in Africa, and used it 
to not only make money for people, mm. but to fuel addiction, because this is about addiction as well, sugar and tobacco. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. Mm. It wouldn't have happened. That, I, I love the, I've never thought of archaeology as democratizing, but I, but I, I mean, that's fantastic. And also the idea of like a psychic archaeology as yeah, well as, as, a, as a physical Always one. Always dig, yeah. Uh, we're about halfway through, so I'm going to remind you that we're going to go to questions in about 25 minutes. So start thinking of questions from now. But we're going to shift gears slightly, and I'm going to come back to you again, Bonnie, because you came, as you mentioned, you came of age during the civil rights movement. And there are many sort of physical places that represent or engage in that. Are there any particular physical places that come to mind when you think of the, the civil rights movement or even your own personal experience during that time? No. Well then. <laughs> you know, no, well, you know, I know, honestly, uh, because, um, you know, things change mm. quite rapidly. If you grew up in the 60s, there mm. were huge arcs of change. You know, I was thinking someone would talk about the lunch counters in the early 60s. But, you know, my generation rejected the lunch counters. That was actually what we were against. Mm. So these weren't places, you know, we weren't, you know, our parents were the turn the other cheek generation. We weren't turning in the other cheek. Mm. So the lunch counters didn't have, don't have, I mean, now if you're 50 years away from it, it does have an arc, you know, sort of an iconic thing. But at the time, that was the last thing we were interested mm. in was a lunch counter. Um, and so I, I wouldn't say that there's anything that I think of that is a historic side of remembrance. Um, but people, the further you away from thing, the more iconic it becomes. It Isn't isn't at the time. Mm. You know, it isn't at the time. Um, in my generation, I suppose if the ruins of Detroit still existed, that would be iconic mm. for me, where young people tried to burn it down. That would be iconic. Um, and probably the Lorraine Motel balcony where Dr. King was assassinated, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. iconic for me. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, uh, the bridge where the late John Lewis walked across mm. um, uh, for civil rights, for voting rights, the Pettus Bridge, that's iconic for me. Um, and those things are iconic mm. for me. Um, the Lorraine Hotel, Motel particularly because I can remember exactly where I was when uh, Dr. King was murdered. And um, it was the same time zone as Chicago. So mm. I know exactly where I was. And I, it only, I could only listen to his voice two years ago. Oh, wow. I, from that day, from that day, I couldn't listen to his mm. voice. So that motel is iconic for me. Mm. But I don't want it to be fetishized. Do you know mm. what I mean? I don't want people to go there and make pilgrimages there because that's the, that's the opposite of what he was about. Mm. And in, in fact, actually, the civil rights movement was exactly the opposite of people trying to put things in stone. I mean, I'm really interested in curating as opposed to obfuscating and worshiping stuff. You know, you have to be constantly active about what these places are about. Mm. They can't be about, I'm going to make a pilgrimage to Lorraine Motel. So what? Mm. You know, what, what, what are you going to do in your life? Mm. Because that's what the Lorraine Motel is about. Not about mm. you being there. What you going to do after you leave the, Lorraine, the, 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 the monument? And I think the Civil Rights Monument should be active like that to ask people, fine, you saw it, so now what are you going to do? What are you going to do, yeah. David, I might ask you, to respond to that, because I could see you sort of nodding in your cogs. What, what, in terms of what Bonnie is saying, how does that, how do you feel? Uh, it's, def it's different for me, obviously, as a, as a, as a Brit. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I have a slightly different take in, in that, you know, I mean, as I say, growing up at the time that I did, and sort of, um, uh, a, a lot of these, a lot of these sort of questions for me are, 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 are all about my sort of, a kind of fractured identity, this idea that I'm British, mm. um, English. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, exactly. You know, it, but, but it's... I mean, to I, be I, fair, I don't know if the Brits can... Like, I don't know any Brit that can answer that. It's like... It, but, I, but I, you know, I... I, 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 I you know, I've, I've come back... I've been... I've spent six, six, six or seven years outside of the country, and I come back, and, and we have a, a government that, you know, is constantly banging on about 
the Union Jack, and we should have flags everywhere, and we, it's the Queen, and, and as so many of those things, um, particularly the Union Jack, uh, it's, it's, I, I find the Union Jack a, a strange object, because mm. a lot of the people, when I was growing up, a lot of the people, who, a lot of the skinheads who were chasing me had Union Jacks, were wearing Union Jacks, or mm. emblazoned Union Jacks on their jackets, so, and there was a, a, a huge saying when I was growing up, I'm sure most people know it, that there ain't no black in the Union Jack, which was drilled into me as a young kid. So I, I, I find myself as a, as, a, as a Briton, as an Englishman, mm. but with so many complexes, mm. so many, uh, so many, um, so many difficulties and sharp objects in my mm. past that, that sort of keep me from being settled in my, in my own identity. So it's, uh, as I say, I write about it in my book how, how, how fractured mm. my sense of identity is because yes, I'm British and I speak English, and, you know, but sometimes I don't necessarily feel comfortable mm. um, here because um, so many of the symbols around me don't seem to involve me or don't, mm. se don't seem to be about me, don't seem to, don't seem to include me. Mm. And um, if I let that get out of hand, it, gets very it just gets very uncomfortable for me. Thank you for being honest, I think, because I think it's, um, it, it's, it's incredibly personal. And it's in for me, it is a very personal question. That's going to say, that's why I had a breakdown. Yeah. Uh, this <laughs> fractured sense of identity, which I've done, worked hard to put together. And I do feel better having investigated my, my, my past and having been back to Harewood House and trying to understand my, my legacy, my story, my, uh, uh, you know, my, my journey throughout my life. But I, but I, it, I wouldn't say it's made me feel comfortable mm. in my skin. I'm still, the more I find out, I would say the less comfortable I get because um, uh, there's just so many unanswered questions. Mm. My identity is on the slave boat. That's your... That, that is who I am. I'm of the boat. Mm -hmm. And um, my allegiance is to the boat. Mm. And being in that middle passage. And once I got on that boat, once I was put on that boat, I had to change my identity. Mm. I had to know because as I'm on the boat, I'm looking straight ahead into the void. And so I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know why my own people maybe put me on that boat. So my allegiance is there. And you know, I have two passports and all of this, and I'm grateful for that. But that's where I, my, mm. my nationality is. Thank you. And John, I'm going to bring you in here, but I'm, I'm going to sort of go off script slightly, because you are you know, with the World Monuments Fund, and there's a question about you know, the, the monuments and the important sites in the history of the civil rights movement and so on. But also, ostensibly, you also have an engagement with the, the same histories that we're talking about in just a very different way. And I'm curious, as you sit here, how you feel sort of both in your role as an archeologist, but in your role as somebody who, I'm not sure, you've, you were born, you mentioned in North Africa, grown up perhaps here in the UK, a little bit. A not little much, bit, actually, but not yeah. much. So I'm curious, like, in these conversations around identity, all of us sitting on the stage have various engagements with identity. I'm curious about yourself. Uh, that's a great and difficult question. <laughs> uh, so, I, I, exactly. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I, I was born in, in, actually was born in Libya, and I've spent most of my life uh, out of the UK, except for a kind of working career. Uh, so. I've, I've also been a, a slight outsider, not, not in the same sense, but that sense of looking in onto this country, which I, I visit and now is my home. Uh, so, but, I, but I think that's in a way that, uh, for me, it's, it, that, that traveling background is where I get my sense of identity and why uh, I became an archeologist, because I'm just interested in that, the heritage of multiple nations. That's, mm. that's kind of what, I guess, grounds me, if that makes sense. Interesting. And in that question of heritage of multiple nations, and also to, to actually pick up on something you said, Bonnie, because I think you are right, and I think your challenge is fair. Perhaps things are less erased than we might think they are. Part of that also is story and history through 
like through oral conversations, through oral histories and so on. And this is my very seamless change to a video that we're going to play about some oral history. Do you want to introduce the video, John? Yeah, certainly. So, so this is a, a, a discussion that we have all the time is, is when histories are related to places which are not kind of heritage, which is palaces or ziggurats or, 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 or pyramids. Uh, it's the more commonplace heritage. It's where you or I live. It's, it's you know, the terraced house. Is how do you bring those places alive? How do you prompt the discussions which you hope people will leave and, and take action about? And one of the best ways that we find to do that is through oral histories. And we've run uh, an oral histories project which is based out of uh, the southern United States in, in Birmingham. Uh, and the, the video that you're about to see, it's a very short clip, is from someone called Teresa Burroughs. Uh, and she's very much associated with the, the Safe House Black History Museum in Greensboro, uh, Alabama. And the thing which I find really interesting about what she says is that she says that there's, that, and I've got the quote somewhere, so just listen out for it, is that we, we have nothing to show for our participation in this movement, this movement being the civil rights movement. We needed something positive that we could see, and so hence this, this museum, this house is created. And, Hence the video. This house was once living quarters for people that worked at the cotton gin, which is located across the street. The people that owned the land sold these houses, and my mother and father bought them. These houses are about 110 years old, but they're still sturdy and strong. Coretta and I had been doing each other since I think we were 14. We had an organ that my granddaddy used to play. I would be on the organ and Coretta would sing. She had the most beautiful voice. The people all in this neighborhood would come out on, out on our porches and out on their yard and just stand. I said, who is that? I never heard her sing after we grew up. She laid aside her talent. It all went to Martin and the movement. We had been at have regular meetings, uh, mass meetings at St. Matthew Church, which is over there. That particular night, we had Reverend Showsworth, T.Y. Rogers, Jose Williams, Alva Turner. You know, Martin was the slowest person. He's slow to speak. He's slow to walk. He's slow to talk. And he was still there, talking. So this someone came in the church in such a hurry, and they said, is Dr. King here? And we said, yes, he's here. I said, don't take him down 14, because the clans waiting on him. All the churches around was burning. So that's why we brought him here. Every man in the neighborhood they had to grab their gun and they surrounded this house. And Martin was in their sleep. He was so tired. He didn't even know what was going on outside. The class was still riding and looking. We woke him up around four o'clock and said, hey, we got to get out of here. They took him into Selma, on into Montgomery. Just to slip him out of here. I had so many pictures. I said, they need to be seen by even the unborn generation that's coming along. We have nothing to show for our participation in this movement. We needed something positive that you could see, walk in there and see, and you can almost feel it as you walk in the door. Thank you, that was fantastic. Was good. Yeah. yeah. And before we move on from the Civil Rights Monuments, John, I know that WMF does quite a lot of work with 
monuments and, and sites of history from this time, but many of them are sort of barber shops and churches and so on. Are there challenges? Tell us about the challenges in preserving these places that perhaps, you know, were quite ordinary, as you say, in some sense, but extraordinary in the historical. Yeah, I mean, so, so absolutely. You, m certain people's perception of heritage is of that magnificent building, and yet uh, heritage is as much linked to people and ideas and movements which might be housed and, and happen in really very, very modest buildings. Uh, so, so we often have that as an issue that we face. In, in many ways, sometimes, though, uh, a more modest building is, is easier to get that story across because mm -hmm. whereas I, I, I mean, Harewood House, it's lovely to visit, but uh, very few of us, audience accepted, uh, actually live there. Uh, whereas a, a terraced house in, in Birmingham or, or wherever is, is much more akin to something we recognise. So I think there's something about ordinary places which are connected to extraordinary mm. events which really bring it home. So in a way, it's easier. Mm. Uh, and the other thing, uh, I think there's a whole different way in which you can engage people in these places. Art is one way, oral history we've just mm. heard is another, music. Uh, and then, uh, as Bonnie's saying, the kind of the, the, the provocation to action that these places mm. bring about, I think, is an equally important way. Yeah. I think, you know, like, I mean, I would say, in a similar way, um, the statue of Edward Colston is probably far more interesting now, sprayed with graffiti <laughs> and laying on its side, it's far more interesting now than it probably was standing up on that plinth. And I'm glad it's still, uh, still intact. Yeah. See, that's the other thing I want to say, too, because if we take statues down and destroy them, and remember, human beings have been doing that forever, there will come a time, and I promise you, where, you know, let's say Darkest Howe's statue is in that place where it should be anyway, mm -hmm. in Bristol. And you can tell a kid, oh, well, this slaver was there. And that kid will say, I don't believe you. Mm -hmm. I don't believe you. You had no evidence you showed me. You mean Darkest statue was never here? I don't believe it. We have to let people see everything. They have to see it. And that's what curating is called. Colston, the name, I did a program in, on, in Bristol about, about a, a pub called the Colston Arms that had a battle in which white African-American soldiers and white British soldiers fought white GIs because the black men were allowed to drink in there. Now, if you're an African-American and you come to Bristol looking for that as a place of pilgrimage, you aren't going to find it because they're not using the word Colston. Mm. And see, that's the dangerous part mm. of doing this. Hmm. All right, we have a few minutes left, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you all for final thoughts in a minute, but I'm also going to encourage you to think of some questions. And if you're actually watching via the live stream, you can enter a question by typing it into the chat box, and it will come through to me like magic. So, Bonnie, I suppose... You know, as you're, as you're a storyteller, you are involved in curation. I'm very curious about your thoughts on the moments in black history we choose to remember. And, and, and where do we go from here, given this particular moment in time we're in? I love hearing you talk, this beautiful voice. No, really, you do, when you say kind. here, when you say here, that was great. I suddenly heard. Um, I hate nostalgia, mm. so I don't want people to be nostalgic about anything. I detest nostalgia. I, dest I detest weeping and crying at places, is that rubbish? Um, you should meet my mom. No, I'm serious. <laughs> it's rubbish. Um, If we, pres if we, first of all, I don't, I don't believe in getting rid of anything. I don't mm. think, I think that that's not what you should do. Mm -hmm. um, everything is connected to human destiny and human story, and we shouldn't be afraid to tell the stories. Mm. We shouldn't be afraid to do that. And maybe, 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 maybe. So I'm thinking of David because we're both sort of voyagers in a way. Maybe the 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 job is to keep telling the story mm. just keep telling the story um you know and i think it's an insult to africans especially ancient africans to say they were victims mm. they weren't victims i mean these are 
we're talking about very sophisticated societies that, that played a part in my being here and, uh, you know, roll the dice, mm -hmm. basically. And we need to tell stories in that way. Don't do that to African culture. Don't make African people look like they just suddenly were, you know, hands up, I can't deal with this. That didn't happen. We're talking about extremely sophisticated people. So let's, let's open up the whole thing. Let's look at the whole story and see it. Because in that way, I guess maybe David and I, I keep thinking about you because of what, you know, we're, we're both doing, we're both kind of troubadours. We're just going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to kind of find that place because our ancestors were on boat, were on a boat, mm. were on boats and around water. I really want to stress that about mm. people in, in the so-called diaspora. I think that is so important. Think and about the whole story. Yeah. Yes, yes. And John, I'm going to come to you. How, you know, thinking about what Bonnie's just said, how does an organization like WMF make sure that the story remains fluid, right? How do archaeologists not decide this is the story and, and allow it to continue being told? Believe me, archaeologists will argue till the you know, cows come home in terms of... Uh, uh, and we can do that because the evidence is so ephemeral. No one can get it right and prove it for 100%. I guess in terms of World Monuments Fund, it's the, it, I come back to the fact that we're rooted in uh, the community who live, work, play mm. in the shadow of these places. So I guess our, uh, the, the, the thing which we hold most importantly yeah, most important is that what do those people feel about the places on their doorstep and how do we help them uh, to, to preserve those places and to tell those stories and they, they are multiple stories. Mm. To ensure that you're led by local communities I think is definitely the way to go and David I mean you've told us you've shared very openly how the history is still like maybe like a fractious and fractious and contested thing for you personally. I guess, how would you reflect on how we think about history in Britain at the moment and whether or not it's changing? Do you think it's changing? I think it sort of has to change. I think it has to continue to change. Mm. And, um, I think, you know, we all have to keep engaging with it and not sort of, um, not, um, you know, abiding by one person's uh, view of it. I think what's great now is you, is this, this new generation, this younger generation, my kids' generation, you know, I'm, constantly inspired by my kids and how they, mm. how they um, uh, share, talk their, 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 in terms of gender fluidity, in terms, in terms of race. They are much more engaged with, with uh, the questions of race and, and, and uh, dual heritage and, and, yeah. and mixed race. Mm. And, and, uh, you know, they're much, in, in, in terms of the conversation on who they are, they're far more advanced than, than I was and far more knowledgeable than I was. And I think that's really exciting and hopefully, you know, you know, when, when, when they're taking care of me, when I'm an old man, um, this world will be very, very different. And, um, and I'm hopeful for this new generation that they are different to us and will we'll take the conversation just, uh, you know, a step further. That's fantastic. Can we all, can you all give this lovely panel a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for an open and honest and really fascinating discussion. Now, this is where you all have to do a little bit of work, right? I'm gonna ask you to think of some questions and if you have a question and you're in the audience and you can make your way to one of the microphones that I think there's a microphone just in front of uh, the stage here so you can come and share your question. Raise them or something. I Bonnie can't has asked see anybody. The lights again. We can't we, well, we'd anyone. love to see your beautiful faces. We'll see your faces. Can't see anybody. Somebody's going to have a question. Who's going to have a question? Well, we are actually going to start. To kick us off, I think we have Stephen Battle, um, the Principal Program Director of the World Monuments Fund, in the audience, who's going to come share some, some reflections, perhaps, from his recent visit to Bons Island. I don't know if Stephen you knew that this was happening, but it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Um, look, hard act to follow, that's clear. Um, so, yes, I was just in, in Bunce Island uh, on Friday um, in, and uh, on a trip to Sierra Leone. And um, so, I, look, I think my main, my main takeaway from tonight, um, 
So let me just say, we've, so we've, we've been doing those conservation work. I haven't been doing it. Our team in Sierra Leone, which is led by Isaac Smith, who's a very, very competent um, conservation person, uh, working with the Mon Monuments and Relics Commission of Sierra Leone, um, with funding from the US Embassy. Um, and we finished this work in 2020. So I, I was just had the great privilege of going back and seeing what they've done. But I, so, so the reflection I take away from t tonight is actually how important working on places like Bunce Island is. And, um, uh, and it's the, that personal importance that comes through from the testimony that we've been hearing tonight. I mean, it seems that it's important as a, as a way, places like Bunce Island, you were in El Mino, I haven't been to El Mino, but it, Bunce Island is very similar, smaller, very but similar. It seems to be, it's a, it's, a, it's a way of filling in the pieces in that kind of personal jigsaw. And, um, and so, you know, I feel um, humbled to have been able to participate in this exercise in Bunce Island. Island, e even more so than I did before, dramatically more so. So th thank you for, for that testimony, and I will certainly relay it back to the team in, in Sierra Leone. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> now, I have some questions that are coming through from online, but please, if you're in the room and you have a question, would you like to, would you like to come to, you, you're welcome to come to the microphone. Go on. Thank you for a lot of food for thought and an interesting conversation which could go on and on. Um, as the child of two teachers, I was just wondering that as much as there can be preservation of physical monuments, what's incredibly important is the ability to get the message, the stories out there, not to those who know about them, but particularly to those who are either ignorant of it or actually who have been brainwashed in something completely different. Given how much there is in the conversation about what can can't be taught in schools, in a broader context, I wondered how the World Monuments Fund and the message can be gotten out there in terms of actually broadening the understanding of stories and places that shouldn't be overlooked. So, I mean, a quick Good answer from me would be actually back to Bunce Island. Uh, and I was talking to Stephen earlier today in the office, and we, we have run this educational program in Bunce over the, the last uh, few years bringing kids from, from Sierra Leone to the island. And one of the things which Stephen said was that uh, it was remarkable how many of those kids didn't understand, had never come across this bit of their history. That's correct, Stephen? So, so you know, let, start, from my perspective, is start to engage people in those places because that's what I do. Uh, but I think that's just one in a series of uh, kind of uh, tools in the armory, some of which is... Uh, uh, as we said, oral history, some of which is art, some, you've just got to find different triggers to actually get people to, to see places in a different way. I am um, um, one of the projects, I'm doing a big project back at the British Museum where I've gone back, and part of the project is working in the state sector. Um, I got my permission to be a citizen because I taught school in the state sector in Lambeth and in, in, um, in Brent, bringing over a Shakespeare program I developed on the Lower East Side. And I remember um, I started in the um, beginning of the 90s, and I was told by teachers of color and white teachers, why do you want to teach these kids Shakespeare? I didn't understand the question. Um, I literally didn't understand it. Um, so for me, part of the project that I'm doing called Era of Reclamation at the British Museum is to work with state, with school, with teachers in the state sector because most of our kids, that's going to be their experience, is going to be in the state sector. I want to particularly work with non-ethnic minority teachers so that they feel confident to deliver black history to their mm -hmm. students. I've told many of them, your white guilt is of no assistance to me. It's of no... Hmm? I think repeat that for the audience. Oh, I've, I've said to these teachers, your white guilt is of no assistance to my students or to any black kids or any minority kids. Keep it out of the classroom. Not interested, okay? 
You're there to teach. You have a vocation. I'm gonna help you stand up in front of those kids so that you can deliver this history to them. They're gonna challenge you. They're gonna do all kinds of things because they're bright. They're gonna say what they have to say. But you have to feel that you can stand there and you can do this because otherwise you are useless in the classroom right now. So that's one of the things that's kind of like my mission there is to give these teachers in the state sector enough education, enough background, enough confidence so that they can be of use to this generation who is gonna pass through their hands, not only ethnic minority kids, but, but kids who are not ethnic minority. Because that's the way, as, mm. as David has said, that's the way the world's changing. Mm. If you're not on board with this, you're gonna be run over. So education to me, and if, if the fund can help, and really, making, giving, I'm very much a tools person. So how do you make tools so that a state teacher can actually deliver black history, history, period, mm. history of human beings that is absolutely unbiased, straight, and authoritative? Otherwise, what's the point? If she could drop a mic, she would. <laughs> Thank you, Ronnie. Do we have any more questions? Folks, questions. please make your way. Is there anyone? All right, we've had two people who are presenting as men. I encourage the women to also get up as well. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. First, can I say thanks to David? I think his, his very frank um, description of how being black in this country has impacted on him is huge. Mm. Because what it does is it allows the, the normal ones of us in society, if you like, um, it, 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 normali it normalizes the experience uh, when we talk about this, the, the trials and the tribulations of being black in this country. So thank you. It's a huge thing. Um, really, I want to talk about the two sort of key words that have come out of this discussion um, tonight, which is archaeology and erasure. Around about 16 years ago, I went on a slavery history tour of Liverpool. That's the mm. city where I'm from, as the accent might suggest. Um, and I've always known that Liverpool played a part in, in, in slavery. And from then, from that point onwards, come to realize that almost every major building, mm. every park, directly or indirectly, exists as a direct result of the transatlantic right. uh, slave trade. Mm -hmm. So the, the legacies of slavery are all around us. Mm. The wealth of slavery and Britain's position in the world right. is all around us. And people seem afraid to tell that story. Mm. You said that um, uh, David, was commendable. And um, people, we don't want people um, to, pros to prostrate themselves. We want them to acknowledge and, and only acknowledge, and the likes of Troy Deeney calling for it to be on the, the national curriculum. What I, my question is, I want to come to this, this hostility, this, ob this um, objection to telling the story. So you'll get a conservative government that uses words like woke and culture war and, mm. and all this kind of stuff that actively prevents the archaeology prevents mm. it. So just well, if you could just discuss. Walk, walk is a beautiful, walk came from a beautiful space. Beautiful and I'm it's so, bastardized. yeah, it's, it's totally been destroyed. Yeah. And uh, woke was the, uh, was the word that you used on the Underground Railroad when people were being passed from house to house. How you knew that somebody was the person was you used the word woke. And it got stolen, mainly because people took it out of the out of that bat and used it publicly, and then people who didn't approve it. I'm going to be making the keynote at the Liverpool at the Slavery Museum in August, and you are 100% right. This country is a colonial project. The pavement, the the buildings. <laughs> the water, everything. So when folks start screaming and hollering about statues, I'm gonna say, well, what you gonna do about with the ground under your feet? Because that's what it is. David, can I, can I bring you in as well, David? Because you know, this lovely person has sort of said thank you. And do you have any thoughts as well? I, I, I just would hope that we start engaging with it and start engaging, uh, rather than shying away from it or, or, or as they're doing in America now, burning books and trying to, trying to stamp out any mention of the word racism or any, uh, they're actually burning books in America right sure. now, which is just mm. frightening. Uh, and there's, I think someone's even passing a law to, to uh, 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 as a white discomfort law. Yeah. That yeah. you're not allowed to make white people feel uncomfortable yeah. Yeah. when discussing race. I mean, it's, it, it, it's preposterous. Yeah. 
But there are stories that need to be told, as you say. Why is that park called McDouglas, McDouglas Park? Why is that building called so-and-so building? Mm. And unless we engage with that history and have an open discussion about it and all come to an open discussion about it, then we can all start learning about it, start learning about our histories, start learning about why that building was there, what, what, why it was built. Um, learn about this building. And, and just mm -hmm. learn That's it. interesting. Ra rather, than, rather than trying to deny that history yeah. and... and, 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 and Almost like ruthlessly to say it's that it's it was a, I mean there are, there are conservatives who who will call it will glorify Colston or will glorify uh, a, a, um, a, a slave trader who say that he you know he, and he may have benefacted the town but at the same time there's a million other people who who died in, 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 in you know to, to 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 get that building built and I I think. The more we can talk about these buildings, the more we can engage with the story of these buildings. As you say, I think Liverpool's fantastic in that it has started that tour. Um, the more we can engage with the stories like that, yeah. I think the better we'll, we'll all be. Liverpool. We've got a transatlantic uh, international slavery museum yeah. and walking tours happening all the time. Open your eyes. That's it's very be, powerful. That's why I'm going to be powerful. speaking. And, and you know... Um, I'm, wait, sorry, I'm going to be a moderator okay. and jump in. All Thank right. you so much, because we've got a whole bunch of questions <laughs> coming in. Thank you. <laughs> Please, Please go ahead. Um, hi, um, I just, as someone who is in um, secondary school currently, I'd like to ask what everyone thinks about the um, quite poor education around um, civil rights and slavery and the history of generally all oppressed groups, but of course it's uh, the subject of conversation tonight of racial inequality. Um, and where, when we had the education at my school, it was maybe one, two, three lessons around slave, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, and it wasn't very comprehensive. And I think it's in a country that so was so involved with slavery, um, and with empire, and with racial inequality, and all. Um, forms of injustice from oppression of women to uh, racial minorities and um, all sorts. I think I'd like to hear what people on this panel would uh, say about the lack of education, generally speaking, on these issues. Yeah. Thank you so much. David, do you want to take that? I completely agree with you. I mean, I, I, again, we have to really engage with our history and, for, and, and tell all the stories, not just one story not just glorify one particular aspect of, 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 of British history, but really educate people about the uh, universal story. Um, uh, and and it's, it's only that way that we'll sort of lift every, we'll get, every, get us all on the same page, because there's, I think there are too many people who have a, a, a very um, narrow view of, of, of history. And when, that, when only that narrow view gets, gets for you, that's when I think um, people are prone to, um, to, uh, um, to rather not to engage with the wider story of, 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 of people, I think. Can I, can I say, too, that and there's one thing I'm going to talk about up in Liverpool in August, is, you know, you all are too dependent on African-American tropes, African-American history, African-American point of view, American everything. I mean, when I first came here, people were talking about the book that they read to, to learn about black people was To Kill a Mockingbird. I thought, excuse me? <laughs> I, I mean, this, this book was the book. And when I started talking about it, I hate it. I hate To Kill a Mockingbird, frankly. Um, and yeah, I hate it. And so to, to, cause it's BS. So to talk about, you know, that book being the book you have to read as a kid to learn about black people, that's why the trouble, that's where the trouble is. There are a lot of stories that exist about being black and British and about this particular country, but it's, it, it's still true, and I'm gonna say it, it's still true, black Britain depends on African-American slogans, African-American, blah, 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 blah. It's been very difficult. Yeah, but you need to, it's gotta stop. Because, oh, because, read, because, because part, that's part of the problem. I mean, we don't have power, so we don't make the curriculum, but that's part of the problem. All right, thank you. So we have to do our own work. Thank you so much for the question. <laughs> All right, we have.
I'll give you 30 seconds, John, and then we'll have last question. I'm doing a terrible job because we're almost over time anyway. <laughs> so, so my bit of diving in was that there's a book which m people may remember. It's called Our Island History. And it, it's literally a kind of a series of events which is pr presented as a kind of triumphant, triumphant series of events for, for what made Britain great. And I guess part of what we're discussing is actually education is, is the complete opposite of that, that linear narrative of my island history. And it's actually, education should be creating inquiring minds to actually understand that complexity uh, of the past uh, in all its different ways. And part of the issue that we're facing with Putin at the moment is because there's one single narrative there. So, yeah. you know, that, that, that uh, uh, broader spectrum of understanding, I think, is absolutely critical. Good work on the 30 seconds. Last question. Thank you. Gosh, the light. Thank you very much indeed. First of all, thank you. That was just so amazing, all of you. It was really, really excellent. And thank you for being so open. Um, Bonnie, just for you, I should just say that I'm chair of Shakespeare's Globe, you might be pleased to know. Oh, <laughs> you know I have to go see you, because <laughs> Shakespeare's my guy. Yeah. My first question is a, is a bit cheeky, and then I've got a, a proper question after that, and I'll be very quick with the, the cheeky question. The summer of 67 was known as a summer of love. The summer of 2020, probably with hindsight, will be known as a summer of the Great Awakening, because we had the death of George Floyd, which just made us all look at the world differently. And then we had the, the Colson statue debacle, the Rhodes statue debacle. And we started to look at things very differently. And um, I was really interested to hear you use the term Wakandaized because during that summer, I got a phone call from um, Andy Serkis, who played Claw in Black Panther. And he said that that movie had been such a revelation to him. And he realized how important it was and he wanted, when he saw the Colson statue fall, and when he heard all the ridiculous debate around Rhodes to do something, he said, Margaret, what shall I do? What shall I do? We need to do something. And he, he originally wanted to take statues and put them into a park. And we decided that you'd have a battle with government forever. And what we should do is to start to tell rounded histories. So he, we've started something called the Gallery of Living History sponsored by him and film producer Jonathan Cavendish. And the three of us have started it from the ground upward. We're sort of knitting with fog at the moment, but it's really coming together. Mm. Your stories are so amazing that my cheeky request is, as part of my initial curation, can I bring your stories into the Gallery of Living History? Because we're working with school children. We're getting them to understand that this is part of their story. And so that's the cheeky bit. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I, might, I don't actually think we have time. I'm so sorry. It's, it's really fast because this is almost rhetorical. Are, are you all happy? We'll take the question. Thank, all right. thank you, thank the people you, have you. spoken. The last bit, thank you. Go for it. <laughs> the last question is really um, it comes from the fact that I'm Ghanaian, but not from a slave background. Uh, I'm afraid that possibly my family, yes, was guilty. Mm. I understand. And on the other part, I'm Sierra Leonean, and definitely I know that my, um, ma ma my maternal grandmother came from slaves, so there's this incredible sort of um, mixed heritage, just so to speak, inside of me. And one of the things I found really difficult for, as David is that I love Georgian architecture, and I've always found this incredible pain. And then I started to think from the side of my maternal grandmother, we built this. Mm. And so my question to you, David, is when you look at Harewood House, when you look at things, can you manage to recoup a piece of yourself by saying we built this? Because there is an enormous amount of black in the Union Jack. It wouldn't be there Absolutely. the way it is. Absolutely. 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 Thank you. It's a great question. I have to say, on the, on the, uh, just very quickly, on, 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 my, on my first visit to uh, Barbados, um, I, unbeknownst to me, the producers had put an advert in the local paper saying, would all Harewoods meet <laughs> on the beach? Ah. <laughs> and literally 50 people who I'd never seen before turned turn up on, on this beach. Some of them knew my dad, some of them knew my mom, but it was a real warm feeling on the beach that day. But when we showed them pictures of Harewood House, they were like, that's ours! <laughs> they were like, that, and they, but they felt so proud of it. They were, they were looking at it and were saying, that's our big house. So, mm. so, um, Maybe we have reclaimed it for that. <laughs> Maybe we have reclaimed it. Can you all give an enormous round of applause?
Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie Greer, David Harewood, and John Darlington for your brilliant contributions. Thank you for all the I actually have like a suite of questions that have come through here, but oh, I've ignored them all. Have time. That's um, a shame. I know, I know. We could have talked forever. Um, <laughs> and thank you also to Intelligence Squared and the World Monuments Fund for putting it all together. If you'd like to learn more about the WMF or donate to their work preserving vital heritages, please visit www.wmf.org. Thank you all for coming and have a lovely evening. Thank you.